So yeah, my name is Elise and uh, I'm a beekeeper. Um, how many of you guys here have known a beekeeper or have been inside of a hive of bees? Put up your hand. Yes, talking to my people, I love it. Um, I am born and raised an Alberta girl. Um, first generation Canadian, uh, but definitely um, small town. Graduated 35 people, I think 32 of them I knew since first grade. Um, very, very small town. But um, in more recent years, I've become a Calgarian. And I, I have resonate with Luke and you guys, and definitely knowing that this city has so much to offer. It's amazing, you know. When I first moved here, I'd meet people and they'd be like, oh man, Victoria is so nice. There's so much going on there. And then they would leave. And everyone kept leaving. Everyone kept leaving. And now they're all coming back. And it's really exciting because they're excited to come back and participate in something incredibly meaningful and beautiful and um, being a part of some sort of revolution, it feels like, in this city. Um, so I am a proud Calgarian. But I'm not here just to talk about being a Calgarian or being an Albertan. But there are things that are important to know about Alberta, or so I'm told. Um, is that 83% of our population lives in urban settings. So it wasn't just me who left the farm and came to the city for university and really hasn't gone back to the farm. Well, not as much as my mom would like me to. Um, and the average uh, farm size in Alberta is, is just under two sections. Um, and <laughs> that's a lot of land uh, per farmer. But only 11% of Canada's population actually farms in all of Canada. So urbanization is a huge thing in this country in general. And in our province, only 4,000 people are actually, uh, actually have employment through diversified farming, which is kind of sad. And it really does show that, that, um, that the industrial food complex is really taking place in this province. Massive egg is happening. And the other challenge is, sorry, is that if I was to farm or, or want to farm, at my age, uh, in order for me to buy land to farm on, I have to pay two hundred to three hundred thousand uh, dollars for a half acre. Um, that's why Luke, your model of a half acre in the city for free is really appealing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> it definitely means that. Like, talk about mortgage. What mortgage? <laughs> um, and, but the other thing that goes and ties in with this is the fact that in Alberta. Many of you may not know, but Alberta produced 40.5 million pounds of honey last year. Alberta is the leading honey producer in Canada, and Canada is in the top 25. Alberta, we actually produce more honey per hive than most regions in North America are even capable of producing, averaging at a, out about 125 pounds per colony of surplus. That's excess. That's luxurious. You talk about s short summer season, these bees love our short summer season. But the other thing, though, is, is that we only have 789 beekeepers in this province. And realistically, <laughs> they're managing 274,000 colonies in incredibly intensified agriculture. So when I think about that and we talk about agriculture and we talk about bees, always number one thing I get when people meet me, you're the bee lady. I'm like, oh, <laughs> nice to meet you. So what is going on with these bees? Hush tones. What is this colony collapse disorder? Is it affecting our colonies? Are you seeing this? And I mean, it's, it is a genuine concern. I mean, it's something that the media is really covering a lot. And it is a real big problem. Like, Alberta produces 35% of our, our canola export, and 100% of canola in Alberta is genetically modified and is systemic pesticides. And neonicotinoids are directly linked with honeybee deaths. It's proven, it's a fact. And it's a real sad story, but when it comes down to it, so what? I mean, realistically, for me, when I get involved in beekeeping or when I get involved in anything in my community, the last thing that really inspires me to get involved is the fear campaign. Oh, those bees are dying. You had better do something about it. You know, and I, I'm thinking, I'm going, well, you know, um, you know, me and my little two-door Hyundai moving six colonies down 17th Avenue during rush hour, with rolling the windows up at the stoplights because I don't want the pedestrians to see the cloud of bees inside the car leaking out. 
I'm not thinking I am going to combat Monsanto. I'm going to take you on head to head. That is not at all what has inspired me to take, get involved in beekeeping. I got involved in beekeeping because I was a farm girl. I was a country mouse, came to become a city mouse. And when I came into the city, I found out that all of my friends that I made in, in university, all of them were also small town people that didn't have any friends. So I had friends from small town BC, and I'm like, I graduated 35 people. Oh, I graduated 42. And then maybe at the party, there'd be one person actually from Calgary. And they'd be like, what? I graduated with over 2,000 other students. And we're all just looking at them like, that's gross. Right? Like, <laughs> yeah, so it's, for me, it was really important that I was, felt very displaced. I felt like I, I, I Calgary has a challenge, and I don't know if you guys have felt it, but I felt it. There's a thick surface tension on the city. There's a rich um, underlying current here uh, full of beautiful fish and plants and wildlife, but the surface tension is really hard. And if you move into the city, especially if you move to the suburbs, really trying to find a community to connect with can be really challenging. And so for me, I just realized, like, I didn't want to go back to the farm. I didn't want to move back to the country. But something that I knew would really enrich my life was getting back involved with beekeeping or getting involved with nature, or engaging in that way, and kind of bring that familiarity of home back, back to my life here in the city. But of course, urban beekeeping and bees and colony collapse is sort of fear, fear, oh, the four years bees die, all the humans are dead, we're all going to die. I got a lot of press. And, <laughs> and to be honest, I didn't like it. This is great, I love talking to you guys, but the reason why I didn't like it was I felt like, wait a minute, the questions they're asking me and the stories they're telling aren't solving any problems. They're not encouraging you guys to get involved in beekeeping. They're kind of making me the lone freak in this city who's going to take on Monsanto and save the honeybee. And, and I'm just going, but that's not why I'm doing this. I'm just trying to reconnect with nature. I'm really trying to get to know that guy who really likes bees too, and has an air compressor I can borrow when I need it. Um, and, you know, and, and really just, the more I worked with honeybees, the more I started realizing this resiliency and teamwork and collaboration and real community that lives within this hive. I mean, honeybees are a super organism, meaning that they can't live without each other. And I, I don't think humans are very different in that way either. I mean, any event that I've ever put on volunteer, course, whatever, I sell it out within, I don't even have to market. Because you know why? Is people love working with people. Luke has too much yards he can't even say yes to. I put a posting up, I'm looking for yards in the city of Calgary for me to keep bees in. You know, it's free, just sign up. I had over 150 yards marketed, on, signed up on my website in less than a month. I mean, this city is amazing, and people are so eager to come together. And I think it's because it is full of small town people who are really looking for that connection and really looking to re-engage with nature and re-engage with each other. And beekeeping, beekeeping is just, uh, I don't know, we call bees the gateway bug. Um, <laughs> People have never heard of permaculture, never really thought much about local food the way, you know, as soon as you get into a hive, open it, smell it, and see altruism working, really working in a way that makes a society of organisms work together in fluid production without really actually causing any sort of negative impacts on the environment, but actually working in benefit of the environment, I think really inspires people of their own potential. And for us, too, getting youth involved and getting kids involved in programming has been really essential. So my question is, colony collapse disorder or human collapse disorder? Every time I hear a story where it's always got someone in some sort of hardcore-looking bee suit with a very serious look on his face gazing into a hive or a photo of dead bees across the bottom board, and I'm just going, they're asking the wrong question. And, and that's something a professor told me in university. He said... At least the paper writing is not hard. The hard work comes in asking the right question. If you ask the right question, the paper should flow. And I feel that way about anything that I do. What is the critical thing that is happening in our societies that is drawing people together? Why is beekeeping stimulating people to offering way more compassion 
into understanding a, a bug. It's a critter. It's a bug that stings you. And people still, they're going, oh, those darn little bugs. I'm so sorry to see them die. And yet, I could see you turn around and squish that spider without blinking an eye. Um, it's, it's very interesting to see that change. And I look at the city and, you know, the hustle and the bustle, everyone's got their own vehicle, drives alone, goes to the suburbs, their perfect little house all alone. And then you don't even have to get out of your car. You can go into your, you know, your heated garage and close the door without even having to, just pressing a button and you're contained. The plus 15, self-containment. I mean, it's cold here seven months of the year, so I understand. But at the same time, I feel like it's this connection that we're all seeking. It's a connection with each other. And for me, with really seeing all these beekeepers come together and work together, um, it's been really phenomenal. So I keep asking this question. Honeybees work. They have 100 million years of evolution. Uh, since the late Cretaceous period out of Southeast Asia. And here they are, not even indigenous to North America, resilient, surviving. Um, the pinnacle reason why we have an industrial food complex is because of how honeybees pollinate. And yet, no matter how much we try and domesticate them, whether we're artificially inseminating them, now we're doing genetically modification of them. They're the third organism to have their genome codexed. Now that we're doing all that, epigenetics, and all these weird things are coming out with bees that no matter what we do to them, they're still wild. I can put a queen that I've artificially inseminated with genetics into the hive, and those bees will ball up, kill her, and raise their own, and mate her with the local genetics. Pisses commercial beekeepers off. <laughs> what do you mean that $150 queen I bought's dead, and I have this local ragamuffin <laughs> queen in here? And the bees are happy, right? And, but the thing is, is like, what can we see? Like, what is it about local, and what is it about bees, and what is it about people that's really bringing them together and bringing the kids out and bringing the families closer and bringing the neighbors' fences down? And I just really started to see that we can create this hive mentality in our society, that we're craving it, that these city infrastructures that we have in place already support it. We just need to pull the fences down. We already live in high proximity to one another. We already commute on the same routes. We already work in the same office towers and buildings downtown. We really have so much potential. And honeybees, each nurse bee, each, each bee you see flying is female. And they give up their sexuality and nurse and care for every other bee in the hive. If one bee in the middle of winter has access to a single cell of honey, the whole colony eats. If there's only uh, five milliliters of honey in the hive, each one gets their part, and they'll all starve together. Um, it's, it's something really beautiful in seeing, seeing the colony, seeing how it works, but also seeing the human potential and our society's potential and seeing Calgary as a unit in its potential. And so for me, the question is, is why are people responding to honey beekeeping and advocacy so strongly? And what's, what's really missing in order to really facilitate that connection to take us to the next level? For me, I don't know. Anyone who knows me knows I'm a weird bee lady. I am literally obsessed with my bees. And I'll teach courses. I mean, I've taught over 500 students how to beekeep. And, and they all make fun of me day one. Day two, they're in the class. All of a sudden, I'll hear them over the breaks and be like, oh, my God, I'm so excited to get bees. I'm going to get a swarm. I'm going to get this. I'm going to get that. They can't wait. And now I'll go to their house and help them inspect or solve some problems with them. And I'll be standing there, and they'll be talking. But I realize that they're not even talking to me. They're talking to their bees, like as if it's some sort of chihuahua with a sweater on. Um, and it's, it's really, really remarkable to see this human connection and honeybees always work together. I mean, when they decide to develop a new colony, they, they create a swarm, which is a non-aggressive thing. It's actually the most beautiful thing. It's a single colony that has so much surplus, so much excess, that greater than um, Lord of the Wing, Rings trilogy, these bees will take off on an, act, like an adventure. They have no idea where they're going, but they are going to go together. And the old queen will go, and all of the nurse bees will go, and they'll start a whole new colony together. And I'll steal them. <laughs> and I take them, 
and I take them and I put them in a nicer house. Um, well, a house that I can, I can poke at them after. Um, and, and they'll produce their own new queens. They'll take care and store their own little honey and their pollen and their propolis in the hive. And they'll forage together. And they work together. And they always give back to nature. Every time they take something, they give it back through pollination, taking your garden and putting it to seed. They really, oh, I had to put this in. Who wants to see the cutest baby bee ever born? Right? <laughs> they're, they're so cute. They're, they have these hairs on their bodies. They're actually extensions of their, ex, uh, of their exoskeleton. And they come out slicked, and, the, and their wings are soft, and they actually struggle to walk. And you can watch them do it. And the other nurse bees will like give them like a little bit of like a kiss and feed them a little bit of honey. And their first jobs are actually to clean their room. They go back in the cell. They just hatch out of them and clean it up. And I'm like, it's just like people. <laughs> now, if only my nephews could learn that trick, I would enjoy babysitting them more. Um, but they, all, they even depend on each other to build the infrastructure. They hang off of each other. They hold hands to build comb. It's, it, there's, there's so much endearment there. But together, too, we can do the same. I mean, for us to, to be a part of development of arts and culture and food here, we need this collaboration. We need the holding of hands. We need the support. And it's really exciting because this is an entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneur city. This isn't a city of opportunity right now. I mean, you talked about the economic potential in this city. Definitely. But it allows for people like me to be able to be that wacko person be like, I'm going to be a bee lady, and I'm going to carry bees around in the back of my bike, and I'm going to think everyone's going to be okay with it, and I'm just going to do it. And people are. And I mean, I've been beekeeping all over uh, North America, New York, LA, uh, Spoke Seattle, Portland, Colorado. And it's, it, the movements are the same there. There's a lot of potential. And the thing is, is the intrinsic value of bees is there. So I'm going to tell you a short little story about what happened on Valentine's Day this year. I got a call on Valentine's Day from a, uh, a gentleman who lives up in Temple, so um, uh, just outside Forest Lawn. And he called me, and he was, like, really distressed. And in February, I mean, it was a high of 12 or 13 that day. It was actually a really nice day on Valentine's Day this year. And he called me very distressed. He goes, I have bees. And now... For me, I get that all the time. I, I get that call at least six to seven times a day in the summer, more than that. And he said, I have bees. And I said, yes. He goes, but I did something bad. And I said, what? He goes, well, I talked to a beekeeper. I called a commercial beekeeper in the summer and told him I had bees in my wall. They're flying in and out of my garage into my neighbor's yard, and she has daycare. And so we need to get them removed. And the guy said, oh, well, for me to come to the city, it's 500 bucks for me to remove them. And the guy was like, oh, I can't afford that. And he said, well, then you wait till the winter. They'll slow down, and they'll, they'll cluster up, and you just rip them out and just, just kill them that way. So that's what this guy did. About a week before Valentine's Day, so early February, he cut open the wall of his garage, put all of the bees in this into a Rubbermaid, put the lid on it, and then put it under his steps. He called me about five days later, and he was such a mess. He said, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I've done that. I haven't been able to sleep. Can you come and save them? And so on Valentine's Day, I'm there with a Rubbermaid and some frames, and I'm, I'm fitting these bees in this comb that's been destroyed. I don't even know if the queen's still alive, and the bees are all clustered up. And I'm trying to fit these bees in the frames before it gets too cold out, and bees are dying. There's honey everywhere. There's comb. And he's just standing there, and all he can do is keep repeating apology after apology after apology. And I know he's not talking to me. Um, and this is a guy who was afraid of bees, who was afraid of, but he understands, like, the humanity and the connection these bees offer in nature. They are like the little, little guardian angels of nature. And so what I did was I put them in a box, fit all the comb, shook as many bees in there as possible. And I said, okay, he's got a heated garage. I said, what you're going to have to do is every two days or any day that the temperatures get over five degrees, you're going to have to take your bees outside, uncork the front, and let them go poop. And he said, okay. <laughs> What's the temperature I should keep my garage at? And I said, well, you know, no higher than six degrees. Okay. 
He's been taking his bees for walks since February. Now, this is a guy who wanted to kill them. So for me, I really see these stories, and they happen all the time, and I really realize, like, what lessons can I learn from beekeeping, and how can I change how we really engage our communities? Because it's not beekeeping that's the big thing. It's the food production. It's the eating. It's, it's everything. And all the work I do with bees and just connecting with them and figuring out how their societies work, I kind of created a system of how I wanted to build apiaries and bees for communities, ABC. How do I want to build ABC so that it is resilient and it's sustainable and it's replicable that other communities in, you know, from New York City to Moose Jaw can actually open their own, start their own beekeeping clubs or groups or businesses. Like I'm a for-profit business and to making it work for them. So for me, I looked at bees and of course, it's a little compressed, it was more balanced. Hexagon, six steps, bees, right? Um, so the first one is, is making information accessible. So the key thing for me is really making sure that people understand bees, whether it's doing talks like this or doing workshops or having school visits, anything like that, just getting the conversation going. Because I think there's a lot of assumption out there that you should be able to tell the difference between a honeybee and bumblebee and wasp. And trust me, you don't. Because I get a lot of calls. Of, I have a swarm of bees, and I show up at their house, and they have three bumblebees coming in and out from underneath their deck, and they're panicked. Um, but so for me, it's really about getting that information accessible. But the biggest thing, too, is offering a forum. There's, you, can, you can disseminate information to people and tell them what you want them to know, but people don't really feel valued or validated in a community setting unless they're able to participate in a honeybee colony, it's that bee that goes out and finds that new sweet nectar source and comes back and gets to do the bee dance and share what it's found out with everyone else. And for me, it's huge. We have the community hive chat room, privately owned, I own it, chat room, um, 250 members, free membership, all urban beekeepers, sharing everything like, man, my bees died, here's some photos of what looked, can you tell me what happened to, I'm doing a hive inspection on Sunday, first 10 people to email me can come, bring a potluck item. Uh, for me, it's just really about getting those people to communicate with each other. The third one, oh, hold on, let's go back. The third one is collaboration instead of polarization. Honey, a single honeybee colony is not successful without other colonies around being able to participate. Um, and that's really, really important. So this is the fourth year where I've run the Community Hive, and it's the Community Hive Collaborative Purchase of Honeybees and Equipment. And for us, we get all of our hives built here in Calgary by local carpenters. Uh, we have hive tools now that are made by metalsmiths out of town. Um, all of our bee suits and jackets are sewn by local seamstresses. Because for us, it's not just about the products, it's about the community that we're facilitating. If you're gonna spend money on bees to be a part of a community, why don't you just give your money to someone you believe in or wanna support? Um, and our honeybees, we're bringing 96 colonies in at the end of the month for local beekeepers. And 99% of the honeybees that come into the province of Alberta are imported from New Zealand. So for us, we get all 96 colonies from Alberta and uh, BC and Saskatchewan honey producers. And our goal is to really support those small farmers who are looking at diversifying their, their bee business. Because for us, it benefits our education and knowledge in order to support other beekeepers who are up and coming. Because trust me, you go to a bee meeting, I was, what? The first bee meeting I went to, I was 24, and I was probably the only person there under the age of 50, and one of two women in the room. <laughs> I mean, it's an aging demographic, farming is, and so for us, it's really important to support these young, new farmers who are really looking at diversifying. So collaborating instead of polarizing, and then mentoring future mentors and educating future educators. I mean, I found a lot of this, thing that I'm seeing in other cities. I mean, the reason we started uh, the Bee Club in, in New York City, uh, which was emulated off of a program that's happening out in LA that, um, that Ron knows about, and Backwards Beekeepers, is because there was a fist fight in Times Square between the presidents of two different bee clubs. Because they had the New York Fire Department cherry picker there to catch a swarm, and all these club members are sitting there going, what kind of bee club is this? A matriarchy and a beehive of women who nurse and care for all the other things, and then there's two dudes punching it out in the street. It's a little bit weird, and so they start a bee club. And now that's the thing is, I, I can be the innovator of a concept, of an idea, but 
you know, I, I may not be here all the time. I might run away. <laughs> Very likely, I will run away. Um, for me, it's really important that people continue that knowledge stream. Whether you, after today, you're going to know more than what you knew this morning. And you guys are conduits of that knowledge into your families and into your communities. And the last one is replicability. So for me, I do a lot of programming, and all of that programming is really about creating a system so that other programs can start running. So I keynote speaking gigs, level one beekeeping courses, and this one, the Hive Mentality Project. And I brought Kirk Anderson, uh, runs the largest urban beekeeping club in uh, North America out of LA, and he's got over 200 beekeepers come to their every two week meetings, and almost all of them are beginners. I mean, and they have Africanized bees down there. <laughs> and people still want to do it. So obviously, um, we're, people have a strange connection with bees. It's not just me. Um, so for me, it's really, really about creating a system of this hive mentality and getting our city back together, back to working together the way that we did when we were barn raising and farming and, and raising our kids and schooling our kids and riding horses to school. I think the kind of thing that we're, we're able to really trust our neighbors to know that when I go on vacation, not only will my rose bush be watered by my neighbor who knows I'm gone, but I don't have to worry about B&Es because, you know, people are in their front lawns during the day and even in the evening. Um, and I see that potential happening. Calgary is really in a time of transition, and I'm really proud to be a part of it. And you can't forget about the honey. The honey is the sweetest part of beekeeping and it just is this nice reminder of that that when you do give give back to nature give back to your community that you also get to something sweet to share with your friends and family so for me my advice to you after this workshop and hearing everyone speak is really oh is to get your hands sticky okay I'm doing um, I'm doing programming I'm gonna try and get 500 new people this year in a beehive I have bike tours planned field days potlucks if you ever want to get your hands sticky, I can get them sticky for you. <laughs> and, and if not, then definitely connect with your hive, whatever it is, knitting club, gardening, food production. It could be quilting class. It could be learning how to use nunchucks. I, I don't care what it is that you want to do, but connect with your hive wherever it may be because until you connect with your neighbors or your friends or your family, your life is not going to feel as fulfilled because you won't have that interconnection. And I feel human beings are you social just like honeybees are. If we don't have each other, we won't thrive. So thank you all for coming and thank you.